So, yeah. Chikara Pro Wrestling has come to a close. For obvious reasons. But, let's not focus on that. Instead, let's try to remember some of the good times. Let's focus on the positives as we revisit the little promotion that was a little something different. Because today... Thank you so much for the support over on Patreon, Jess K. Chikara Pro Wrestling got its name from the Japanese word meaning power. Now, as for the origin of the company itself, going back to 2000, WWF developmental wrestler Reckless Youth Tom Carter was released from the company. As a result, Carter and fellow wrestlers Mike Quackenbush and Don Montoya began discussing opening their own wrestling school. Now, the goal here would be to teach students in a wide variety of international styles. Rather than just training in the WWF American way, they would show their classes disciplines from all across the globe. At first, this school was going to be called Impact Wrestling, which obviously they didn't stick with as that is now the current name of the former TNA promotion. But then Don Montoya would have to withdraw from the project, leaving Quackenbush and Carter to open the facility on their own, which they decided should be given a different name, and thus the school would instead be called The Wrestle Factory, which officially opened on January 7th, 2002 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Now it should be noted that as all this was happening, WCW and ECW, WWF's main competitors, would close their doors, leaving a wide open space for a Vince McMahon alternative to arrive on the scene. And in wake of this in 2002, promotions such as the aforementioned TNA and Ring of Honor would be born. However, even though those companies are better known to the masses than Jakara, you should know that both of them actually formed after this January 7th date, with Ring of Honor debuting in February and TNA starting up that summer. Okay, now to be fair, Chikara as a promotion didn't officially start until May 25th of 2002, but that is still predating TNA. Now, the original purpose of Chikara was to showcase the top students of the Wrestle Factory, so their first show would feature their best and their brightest, alongside some other well-known independent wrestlers such as CM Punk, Cole Cabana, and Chris Hero, otherwise known as Cassius Ono to NXT fans. And in the main event of this first ever show, the three of them would go against, in a losing effort, to the Black T-Shirt Squad, a group consisting of founders Mike Quackenbush, Tom Carter, as well as Don Montoya. So clearly there was no bad blood there. Following the success of that first show, and more would follow, with Chikara beginning to find their identity. For example, instead of identifying talent as heels or babyfaces, the company leaned more on the international ideals of the school, instead referring to them as Rudos and Technicos, respectively. Then soon after, the chairman of the board, La Parca, would find himself working with Carter and Quackenbush, both in the ring and also to help create Chikara's women's promotion, Kiryoku Pro. Another Japanese word, this time meaning willpower, but unfortunately this secondary promotion didn't last very long. And on top of that defeat, the early hits for this company just kept on coming. Because following this, the promotion was hit with a lawsuit as local residents claimed that the promotion was not properly zoned to hold shows and that the promotion itself detracted from the complexion of the community. Ultimately, it was determined that the Wrestle Factory did not provide adequate parking for Chikara shows. This resulted in the company selling videos of their past events while they continued to look for a new venue, which they eventually found just eight blocks down the road at the St. John's Lutheran Church. From there, a second class would begin their journey at the Wrestle Factory, but they would have to learn to do so without Tom Carter, who would wind up leaving the industry. But then, in November of 2002, Chikara would begin a brand new event called the Young Lions Cup, a tournament that originally focused solely on wrestlers who only had under 50 matches to their careers. However, while this aspect would later be dropped, the tournament itself would remain from this point on until the closing of the promotion. And FYI, Hollow Wicked would be the first one to win the YLC. Chikara then took a break for the Christmas season, creating something of an off-season, if you will, for the promotion, which again is something that they maintained throughout the entire company's existence. Then in July of the following year, Chikara would hold their first ever Tag World Grand Prix, a bracket-style tournament featuring tag teams only, and the team of the Night Shift, which consisted of Hollow Wicked and Blind Rage, would be the first ever winners. After this, and the event would become sporadic at best. Now, throughout the next few years, the promotion would continue to grow, as Chris Hero would accept the training position at the Wrestle Factory, as would Jorge Rivera. And in March of 2005, the Wrestle Factory would move locations to the new Alhambra Arena. And with this new venue being in Philadelphia, Chikara would pick up a working relationship with Combat Zone Wrestling and take over as the official school for CZW. However, the two would part ways in 2007. Also in that year, Claudio Castagnoli, or Cesaro for you WWE fans out there, would take over for trainer Chris Hero. However, also in 2007, February 16th to be exact, we would see the 
debut of the biggest show of the year for Chikara, The King of Trios. And personally, this is where I think the promotion really began to come into its own. For those of you who are unfamiliar, trios are a three-person tag team, which tends to be very popular in Lucha Libre. And with the Wrestle Factory's core belief of international training, it would just make good sense that their premiere event would be something different as opposed to just being another WrestleMania clone. And furthermore, while there are a lot of people who attack WWE's lack of emphasis on tag team wrestling, you have to admit that Jakara really does put it front and center, with their top show being purely about trios wrestling and them not even having a singles title until, well, we'll get to that in just a little bit. Now, going back to this initial tournament, it would feature 16 teams, even including a TNA team, which consisted of Sanjay Dutt, Chris Sabin, and Alex Shelley. However, this group would lose in the second round to the eventual winners of the tournament, Mike Quackenbush and the team of Shanesaw, Jigsaw, and Shane Storm. But as big as this first event was, it would be the following year that would solidify it as Chikara's top show, with the 2008 finals drawing the biggest crowd that the company ever saw at that point of over 550 fans. And while this record would go on to be broken several times, this was still a major milestone for the promotion. Then on November 13th, 2011, Chikara would have their first ever pay-per-view. And to give this show the grand treatment that it deserves, it would feature the culmination of a six-month-long round-robin tournament called 12 Long large summit, and the winner would become the promotion's first ever singles champion, the Chikara Grand Champion. Now, the tournament was announced by Chikara's new director of fun, Wink Vavasor, and he decreed that the roster would be allowed to vote on who should participate in the tournament, but with the condition that the wrestlers could not vote for themselves. And when it was all said and done, Kestik Noli received the most votes. However, that really didn't do him any good, as he only received two wins in the tournament, the lowest amount in his block. But the winner from that block, Block A, would be Mike Quackenbush, and he would go against Block B's winner of Eddie Kingston. And when the two met at high noon in the finals, it would be Kingston, who would be crowned as the first Grand Champion. Then in 2013, the company would start going through some hard times yet again, as the company would shut down in June and not hold any other shows for the rest of the year. Although, so much Chikara's talent did hold a smaller unofficial event in November. But fortunately, during this break, Neon Alley, a digital anime service, would acquire the rights to Chikara events. And just a few months later, the company would announce their return in May, and that they would be beginning a new class at the Wrestle Factory in March. And then in 2015, Chikara would make their debut in the UK, as well as starting their own streaming service called Chikaratopia, and a weekly show called Journey into Chikara. And then that brings us to this year, where the company would announce that they would be ceasing operations. But again, let's just focus on the positives, shall we? As you should know that this promotion really did a lot to deliver something truly unique to its fans. Not only was this an American company that featured a lot of fun foreign concepts, but they also had great working relationships with many companies from all around the world. And also, they featured a lot of strange and really outrageously funny acts, like the Colony, a stable modeled after ants, featuring wrestlers like Soldier Ant, who would do things like salute or throw himself down on an invisible hand grenade, or the Super Smash Brothers, who with their video game inspired gimmick would do things like pausing live matches or getting irate if someone said that Sega was better than Nintendo. Oh, and by the way, this duo is now wrestling as the Dark Order in AEW. Oh, and how about Los Ice Creams, a team that used to feature, again, Cesaro, who once wrestled as the faction member known as a very mysterious ice cream. Now, I get that this kind of comedy wrestling really doesn't jive and resonate with everybody. And yes, the promotion's antics do blatantly scream to the world that professional wrestling is a work. However, in the end, I feel that Chikara was something totally different and something that was completely its own. It existed in its own small vacuum and was a promotion made specifically for kids, as the promotion would remind you of before their live events, encouraging you not to use any profanity. This was just a fun, silly promotion that never really took itself too seriously. And they took everything so over the top and then just kept on going. And it was a show where a wrestling kid could just be a kid. Oh, and it was pretty affordable too, so if you had a bunch of Rugrats, you could take the entire family to a show without having to spend an entire fortune. For many fans, this was as alternate a promotion as any promotion could possibly ever be, stretching the creative boundaries of what could happen between the ropes. And even if this wasn't necessarily your cup of tea, for some, it was just nice knowing that such an alternative existed. So for anyone who is a fan of Jakara, despite everything that happened and how the company came to a close, the good times will always be missed.
Well, there you have it, the history of Chikara. But what are some of your favorite Chikara memories? Let me know down in the comments. And to my Patreon supporters out there, just know that if you go over to my Patreon page, there's a whole brand new tier system with brand new rewards. As I figured that since you guys are contributing and supporting this show, you should have a hand in how this show is made. And don't worry, for now, I'll still be giving out my shoutouts. But on top of that, you could take part in special polls where you get to decide the direction of this channel. But regardless, to all of you, thank you for all the support and thank you for watching. And as always, Dave knows.